If you're thinking about buying a house and credit is one of those things that kind of gets you down, um, you don't know exactly where you stand as far as what you can get based on what credit score you have, if you need to do improving, all that stuff. Today, Aaron and I are going to talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit about credit scores and how impactful they are in the home buying process. Aaron, how you doing? I'm doing good, man. Hope hope you're doing good. I, uh, you know, this is a fun topic to talk about because pretty much everybody, you know, has concerns about their credit. Even people, I think, that have like the best credit in the back of their mind, they're wondering, is there a way that I could get better credit? And would that help me with getting a better home loan? So that's kind of what we're here to talk about today. Sometimes you even work with people like for a while before they can like, if they come to you and they're like, hey, look, my credit's this, mm -hmm. I have down payment, I know what I want. And you, you'll say like, you know what, six months, let's get some of that stuff removed. And let's see if we can kind of get you in a better situation. If, especially if a monthly payment is evolved, sure. if someone comes to you like kind of saying, I want $4,000 a month. And you're saying, Hey, look, you increase that credit score a little bit and you could probably get that. But if you go in there now, you're looking a little bit higher, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the thing when it comes to credit is sometimes it takes six months. Sometimes it only takes 30 days. Sometimes it makes more than six months. I mean, everybody's scenario is a little bit different. And so whether it's a matter of just qualifying for a loan to begin with, or if it's more so a strategy to get better terms so that you either enjoy a lower monthly payment or you can stretch your buying power out. Okay, so let's talk, what is supposedly right now a good credit score? Like what is like, this is the best of the best. It, if, even if it goes higher, it's not really a big deal. Yeah, so, uh, you know, in the world of, of mortgage, basically, if you have over a 780 FICO score, then you're not going to really get anything better. In terms of rate, if you have over a 740 score, you're not going to get a better rate anywhere. But if you're putting less than 20% down payment, um, that thing called private mortgage insurance plays a role. And they care about your FICO score even more so than Fannie or Freddie. So that's where having a 780 or higher score will make a difference in your monthly payment. Even though your rate's not different from a 740 to a 780, your PMI is going to be more expensive with the lower score. So having a higher score can uh, not only save you on a monthly basis, even if you already have pretty good credit, um, but it can also, like we were talking about, stretch out your buying power because that lowers your debt to income, stretches out your budget. So your everybody's goal, like in a perfect world, would be to have a 780 or higher when it comes to mortgage at least. Okay. So let me ask you something though. For a majority of people, like, um, let's say for example, they're, they're in a time crunch, right? They have to mm -hmm. get into a house and they maybe have like a 620 credit score mm -hmm. and, you know, and they're like, you yeah, know, I know I'm not getting the greatest payment in the world. Is there some way where they could kind of like, you know, maybe they suck it up and do the $6,000 a month payment, but you're saying, look, if you do the six month and then maybe in about six months from now, you know, we'll get your credit score up and then we can kind of like get you a better payment. Is there such a thing? Can you do that? Sure. I mean, if, if it made sense to potentially work on the credit and refinance into a better term down the road, absolutely. But it's quite possible. And, and we do this as part of our pre-approval process where when we're looking at your scenario, part of that is analyzing your credit report. And if we're looking at your scenario and we notice that, let's say, for instance, that you've got a credit card that your limit is $1,000, but you've spent $500 of that limit, well, that's, that's starting to take a negative toll on your score. So maybe what we do is we say, hey, Mark, how about you pay that credit card down to 300 bucks? And that's going to get your utilization under 35%, and that's going to improve your score. And voila, you went from... 620 to 640 or what, whatever the case is. So sometimes there's even things that we can do in the very beginning of the process, even when you're applying for the loan, when, you, when you're in a time crunch that can get you an improvement in time. But, you know, always, we're always looking for ways to save people money on a long term. So, mm -hmm. for instance, if you're somebody that's starting off with a lower credit score, I think the big picture goal would be that, you know, a year or two down the road, you're running around with a 780 score and you refinance into much lower terms at that time as well. So a lot of people, like, sometimes they'll have stuff going on in their credit. They want to do disputes. Mm -hmm. The realism of disputes, like, you know, and they're saying, look, if that dispute goes through and they take it off my credit, then all of a sudden my credit's going to be a lot higher. How realistic is that of happening? 
I mean, it's possible that if you're disputing something that the creditor will remove it. However, my experience is that unless you're truly disputing it, like using a professional company and they're, they're leveraging the Fair Credit Reporting Act to like fight, you know, something that's being reported, it's probably not going to come off in a timely manner. The other thing that you're going to run into as well is that everybody's applications, whether they're trying to improve their credit or not, when they're applying for a mortgage, they get ran through a computer program. It's commonly known as like desktop underwriter, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. They've got their versions. Everybody, you know, application goes through this. And if you have uh, trade lines that are under dispute, you'll get an approval, but it's going to tell you, you have to take those things out of dispute. And then you have to rerun those findings to make sure that you still got an approval. So what will happen is, is somebody like they're working with an inexperienced loan officer, loan officer doesn't check the credit report to actually see that those trade lines are in dispute. They run the, the uh, Fannie Mae, you know, desktop underwriter, they get an approval. They say, Hey, Mr. Customer, you're good. You go out, you get them in a contract. And then all of a sudden you're trying to get the loan done. And they're like, Oh, wait a minute. You got to take these things out of dispute and it starts causing problems. So um, if you do have trade lines that are in dispute, I recommend that you get all that stuff figured out before we actually process your application and get you into escrow and all of that stuff. Um, you know, the real question, like when it comes down to disputing, honestly, is like, is it really disputable? Cause yeah. a lot of people, they just think that it's like, well, I, I screwed up. I paid something late, whatever, but I'm just going to dispute it. Cause that's how you get rid of it. It doesn't work that way. I mean, if it's a truly like uh, reported incorrectly and you really weren't late or something like that, then there is a, a process for, you know, getting that removed and disputing it. But if, if you're just basically trying to improve your score by clicking the dispute buttons and it's not really a, something that you can dispute, you're just going to kind of delay the inevitable, which will be removing those disputes and either dealing with the credit that you've got or having to settle up with that creditor to actually like, you know, figure out what the problem was, whether it was usually it's, it's one of two things. They either have a bunch of late payments and then the things closed out. Or they have a bunch of late payments and it's in like some sort of collection charge off status. If it's in that, that's obviously a, a you know, much more of a challenging scenario for your credit score and, and everything. So everybody's scenario is different. So when it comes to, you know, your credit and figuring out kind of that like magic formula, it's a case by case basis. That's where you really, you got to reach out to a professional, reach out to us, love to answer your questions on this stuff. But like, just to give you some insight, the way that it would work is we have access to a credit simulator. So we'd pull your credit and we automatically do this with every single application. We're looking to see, is there a way to improve the person's credit score? Sometimes we only need to improve a score by like five points. Okay. And then you're going from a 695 to a 700 or whatever, and that gets you a better rate or lower PMI or whatever. And it either makes you qualify or maybe makes your payment lower or whatever the case is. So we're automatically looking for those opportunities and using a computer program, a simulator, that's, it's, it's basically like a, what if, you know, if, if we do this, then this will happen. And it'll tell us, you know, Hey, if, if we tell Mark to pay his Amex card down to 700 bucks and he closes the Capital One account, his score will do this. And so there's kind of some strategy behind trying to figure out the secret formula. Because on the same note, you can also mess up your score by paying things off, by paying things down too much. Yeah. Um, because there's kind of this like wacky, you know, formula that they've got that's all about your credit utilization, basically. And so you know, logic would state like, well, I just pay it all off. I don't owe anybody anything. That's better, right? Well, yeah, if you're Dave Ramsey, but if you're trying to, you know, manipulate the, the credit scoring system, it's all about your utilization of owing money and paying it back, basically. So there's, there's a magic number for each individual person based off of their credit history and where their scores are and all that stuff. And so depending on where you stand, will kind of dictate what the best course of action is. Okay. Now, hopefully you guys are enjoying this video about credit scores and all that kind of stuff. If you are, 
like, comment, subscribe. Now, if you want to talk a little bit about your credit scores and see if you qualify, how long you need to go, what things you have to do, there's going to be a Zoom link down below so you can get a call with Aaron and myself and we'll talk to you a little bit about credit scores, what it's going to take to get you into a home or at least get you down that path. Now, another thing to add is Aaron and I are local in the Sacramento area. So we have local people and companies that we work with to help people actually get their credit going. We can get you a list of those companies as well. Okay, let's get back to this. Now, married couples. There's always one that has a little bit worse credit than the other. So how does that kind of work? And I know we talked about this last week. I think it was a little bit, but can you go into that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So I'll tell you right now, the wife is always going to have a better FICO score than the husband. Of I don't, course. I don't know why it just, it always, always works out that way. Um, it ultimately, it's going to come down to who's on the loan. If they're both on the loan, then we're going to have to address the person that's got the challenge credit. Um, if, if the person with challenge credit is not on the loan, then, Hey, that's great. I mean, obviously they'd probably want to get those things fixed up for other things in the future, but in the, you know, for the purpose of getting a home loan, it's all about who's actually on the loan application. So if it's a husband and wife on the application together, they're going to go with the lower of the two. So if the husband's got a 680 and the wife's got an 850, they're going with the 680. So again, it comes down to figuring out that magic formula to get them collectively the best deal together. Okay. And so you can't like bring in mom because she's got great credit. You can't do any of that stuff either. Or how would that kind of work? When you, when you bring in a co-borrower or like, you know, you, you bring in mom or whatever the case is, that is not to improve the credit score. That's to in, add income to the scenario and be able to qualify for, for more, to be able to qualify okay, for right. something. But Every applicant on the on the loan application has to be able to what they call credit qualify, meaning like meet the minimum credit standards. And then the the terms that the people on the loan receive, it's going to be based off of the lowest of the applicants on the loan. So like if you had, for instance, like eight people, you know, on a loan, which doesn't happen very often, mm -hmm. but it could. If you had eight applicants on the loan, they're going to take the lowest out of the eight scores. They're not going to like take an average or anything like that. Well, okay. Let me ask you something then. Okay. So let's say there's a married couple and, um, okay, let's say there's two people that are doing the house, right? And let's say they're not married yet. They're young, but one of them has great credit, great income. And the other one is kind of getting, you know, maybe mm -hmm. they had some fun early on and they got some stuff sure. to work on. Can they, they can actually buy the house based on that one person's credit and income and then actually put both people on the deed, correct? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about how that works. That's just the, we would, we would, uh, well, if they're not even married yet, I mean, it, you know, it's almost as if like the other person doesn't exist, but after the transaction closes, they would add that person to the deed. If they are married and the married person is not going to be, you know, one person, partners not on the, the transaction other partner is um, we would just refer to that as a non-borrowing spouse and then that non-borrowing spouse they can still take deed to title and ownership technically they're just not oh they're, they're not an obligor on the loan basically and that way their credit wouldn't affect the loan correct okay that's cool okay i like that okay so let's let's talk a little bit about like what are little things a person can do like no actually you know what let's reverse that let's talk about how inaccurate Credit Karma and some of these plays. Because, I mean, I've seen a lot of people who were like, Credit Karma, I'm like a 740. I'm a mm -hmm, rock star. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, they go to buy a house, and then they realize these apps aren't as accurate as they should be. It, well, it, it just comes down to there's different versions of FICO, like the actual formula that's used. Just like you have, like, a iOS version, you know, 12 or your iPhone 10 or whatever. Lenders use a specific version of FICO. The credit monitoring services use a different version. The credit uh, card companies use a different version. The car loan companies use. So depending on what type of credit you're applying for, there's a specific FICO formula for that. And Credit Karma or your Experian monitoring or whatever that's provided for free by the bank None of that is going to be the same formula that a mortgage company will actually use. And so that's why there's always a difference. 
Okay, okay. Let me ask you something. Situations that you've actually worked with with clients. Entrepreneurs, I find, because they're so busy and everything too, sometimes they don't have great credit, but they have fantastic income coming mm -hmm, in. Mm -hmm. So like, give us a little a couple scenarios maybe as far as like people who are self-employed, they're doing the bank statement loan, their credit isn't great, but they're making a, a lot of money. Sure. What would you give the those people out there, what would you give them suggestions, how to how to work a deal? Is it even possible for them to buy? You know, what, what does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. I mean- you know, when, when you have money income and you also, you have down payment, having challenge credit isn't a deal killer. There's always, you know, at the end of the day, even at the far end of the spectrum, there's hard money lenders that you can get financing with, which we do those too. Uh, but ultimately the, you know, usually the tricky thing to have to figure out around with self-employed people is their income. Cause they're writing everything off in the yeah. kitchen sink. Right. But let's say that even after all the write-offs and all that stuff, they're still crushing it. Or maybe they are going to use a bank statement loan or whatever the case is. Um, having challenge credit isn't a deal killer. You don't have to have a 780 FICO to get in the door. Um, however, just like anything, the better your credit score, the better the terms, the more access to things that you will have. So uh, with a self-employed person, it would be the same story of, of you know, as somebody that was employed where we're going to assess their scenario, figure out basically like maybe they could pay this off open up a new card, maybe close out an old one, or maybe we really have to like bring in the big dogs and hire a dispute company or something like that. But ultimately the idea would be to get them a minimum credit score needed to get their foot in the door with a, with getting financing. And then down the road, of course, as credit improves, they could refinance. Okay, so credit is like the main focus on this video, but also let's let's. I know some people that we worked with right now that are kind of like talking a little bit about like, hey, I have a bankruptcy. How long do I have to wait? They don't have the greatest credit in the world. They're kind of building from scratch. Like, what does that look like when you talk to someone like that? Sure. So bankruptcy, uh, you know, it depends on what type of loan you're doing, but typically you're going to need anywhere between two to f up to four years of what they call seasoning, basically time from when it. Happens happen to the time of when you're getting your loan uh, in order to be eligible for a mortgage if you had a chapter 7 bankruptcy. If you did a chapter 13, um, it'll depend on are you still in the 13? If you're still in it and you can actually get court approval to enter into new debt, basically get a mortgage, then if you've been paying that on time for 12 months, you can actually qualify for FHA financing and some other types of loans. That's very odd scenario though, typically when somebody would file a 13 and then they're still making the 13 payments and the court would approve them for a, for a mortgage. Usually what I see is that the 13 has been discharged at that point. So they've, they've done their repayment plan, they've discharged their bankruptcy, and then they're just basically, they're, they're waiting on the normal seasoning timelines. Um, there are, however, loan programs where there's no seasoning requirements. So like those companies yeah, or the lenders, I should say, that do the non-QM loans, the bank statement stuff, things like that. Um, they also are flexible when it comes to credit events. And so if somebody had a major credit event like a bankruptcy, but they had good income, they had a down payment, something like that, then that would be something that we'd be looking at right away for them so that they're not having to wait four years or two or whatever it is for the traditional mortgage program. Okay. So let's say someone like called you up right now. They have great employment. They make a good amount of money, but not entrepreneur, like crazy money. They make good money. They're saying you're, them, they're talking to you and they're like, Hey, look, I got a credit card in college. I went a little mm. overboard, went to Havasu, all, all that kind sure, of fun stuff. Sure. They got some debt going here. I got about a 580 credit score, but, and I got some student loans here and there. What does that What does that look like for you? Like, let's say, like they're making in our area, neck of the woods. Let's say they're making 120, right? Mm -hmm. So they're making good income. Uh, they've been at the job for maybe a couple of years, maybe during college and everything too. They're out of college now. They got a little debt. They got some uh, school debt, credit card debt, and they're about a 580 credit score. Um, and of course, they bought themselves a new car. Sure. Like, what does that look like as far as like what they can afford? What what would you advise them to kind of like, hey, look, let's fix a few things. Let's get everything under under control a little bit and then maybe just shoot six months, a year. What does that look like to you when someone would call you up like that? 
Well, I mean, if if the goal is to become a homeowner, which I am aligned in that goal in terms of like I believe the longer you wait, the more it's going to cost you. Prices just keep going up, unfortunately, and so over time, the longer you wait, you're going to pay more down the road. So. If you subscribe to that school of thought, then getting into a house today versus two years from now is a better idea. So if I've got a 580 FICO score today uh, and I can still qualify for a mortgage today, um, I'm probably going to recommend that that, that's what's going to make the most sense versus doing credit restoration and maybe waiting six to 12 months or longer to get the score that you need in order to get the program that you wanted. But regardless of that, the monthly payments always have to matter. Even if we're not talking about credit repair, part of the conversation with, you know, somebody is going to be basically, well, what is your goal? You know, you're, you're making 120, obviously you've got your car, you got these things. What is the monthly payment need to be in order for you to be able to like afford, you know, to be able to afford the monthly nut on this house. And if you were to say, you know, Hey, uh, it can exceed $2,500 a month or three grand or whatever that amount is, there's there's kind of like some reverse engineering of math to figure out, okay, well, with rates right here and this and this and this, all right, you could qualify for X amount of sales price. If that number doesn't get the job done, then that's really where like we start doing triage and figuring out, okay, well, if we got the 580 score up to 660, then you'd be eligible for this program and then the rate would drop to this and then you could get up to this purchase price. You know, and, and then maybe that's the path we take. But um, the idea is always like, you know, what can we help you with today? Um, you know, it does that get you, you know, your goals accomplished today? And if it does, then that's great because, you know, the sooner you're building equity, the better. If not, then it's figuring out the roadmap to get you to that price, whatever it needs to be. Okay. So how long do you, I mean, I know for us, we've talked to a few people who've had credit or credit challenge Sure. and you know, six months, a year later, they're kind of back in the game and they're, they're okay. And they're starting to look. So as far as like, I mean, you know, depending on everything, like what do you think is a good time frame as far as for someone to uh, do the Rocky Balboa with their credit and get it up to a certain level? Like, what would you say roughly? Yeah, it's like four to six months unless, you know, and, and that's assuming that like there's actually some like things that need to be done on a disputing level. If it's literally just a matter of you've been paying your bills on time, but you owe too much on, you know, your credit cards or whatever, and there's a, a magic formula needed to get that number to, you know, where your uh, balance of your credit card to your credit limit, they call that credit utilization, how yep. much you owe versus what you can borrow. Um, getting that into a, you know, an equilibrium basically to where it's helping your score versus hurting your score that can happen in as little as like less than 30 days. Like you do something today and on the next billing cycle, whenever you're, you know, cap one or whoever, when they report to the creditor, voila, your scores changed. So there's some things that can be done really quick. Like I got a buddy, for instance, he reached out to me. He hadn't, you know, he had never applied for anything. He's one of those people that's like, he's paid cash for everything, never borrowed any money. So it's like, he's, he's got no credit which I mean, you know, one might think like no credit's worse than some credit or, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, but everybody has an A on the first day of school and that's applicable with the world of credit too. And so what I told my buddy to do is I said, hey, go apply for a Capital One credit card. They'll approve you on the spot. Don't go spending it. This isn't about, you know, going shopping. This is about qualifying for a mortgage, right? So he applied for the credit card, got approved immediately because everybody's got an A on the first day of school. He didn't have bad credit or anything like that. They approved him. I don't remember how much for, it doesn't matter. And within uh, like two to three weeks, whenever the next cycle, whenever they reported to the, the credit bureaus happened, he had like an 803 FICO score. So he went from no credit to like the best credit that you could, you know, have. Why is that? It's, it's because he just had nothing to report on. And then all of a sudden he's got one positive trade line reporting. So it's possible that we can do something like that or have you pay something down or open a new account or maybe close an account or whatever. And it'll have an immediate pop and get you where you need to be. But if, if the scenarios, 
you know, a little more complicated. There's a lot more history, a lot more skeletons in the closet to deal with than, you know, that could take four, six months or so. Okay, how about length of credit history? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a big one too. Like you said, sometimes people have, for some reason, they jump back in the game and all of a sudden they got, hey, everything's forgotten, you're good to go. You got like an 820 or whatever, Mm -hmm. whatever the highest credit score is and you're good, but you've only been kind of maintaining that credit score for maybe three months to six months. How important is credit like like how old your credit history is. That's a, it's, it's very important. That makes up like a good, like third of, of the weight that they put into the scores that you get. It's like your payment history is about a third, the length of your history is about a third. And then there's like this convoluted, like black water that nobody knows, you know, the exact, (laughs) but yeah, exactly. They won't give up the, you know, it's like it's KFC secret recipe or whatever. It's locked up somewhere. Um, you know, as far as the length of credit, it's it's important to have a long, like the longer your credit history, the better. That's why like, you know, little old ladies that pay their bills on time forever have like 850 FICO scores. It's just, you know, they've, they've been doing it forever. That's why though, it's important that like, let's say you are paying off debt. Like a lot of people, they think that it's just like, I'm going to pay off my debt because that's like the smart money move to do. Yeah. And, and they automatically think that that's going to make their score go up. Well, I've seen it happen plenty of times where they pay off their debt and part of their payoff, they, they close the account. And that was their longest standing account. And all of a sudden they went from having a 10 year credit history to a 12 month and it actually dropped their score or whatever. And they're like, why, what the hell happened? I don't get it. Well, it's not just about having debt and paying it on time. It's, it's like the length of it and everything. So that, that, that definitely plays a role too. All right. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, cause I have seen that before. It's like, Oh my God, like, you know, you got an eight, whatever. And, but you've only had the credit history mm-hmm. for three or four months. I figured it was weighted in there. I just wasn't sure how, how much it was. Okay. So for you, okay. So there's still going to be a lot of people who are probably watching this video who are kind of like, it's a scary thing, right? Sure. To check your credit, to fix your credit. It's like IRS. It's like the dentist or doctor. Mm-hmm. It's just something a lot of people would say, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm not, I'm not, kind of worthy to buy. I don't, I'm not going to buy. There's just no way I can buy. Um, I also people like you don't know unless you ask, you know what I mean? And if you ask and you get sort of a certain plan in place, um, it could be good. I mean, maybe, you know, like time your life, not the market, sure. but at the same time, um, figure out where you stand in the market. I mean, maybe all of a sudden one day, boom, you got a kid all of a sudden and, and you get this last minute kind of like, Oh God, I, I need to get a house. Yep. How do I do it? I haven't checked my credit in a while. You know, I'm just renting. I thought this would be me for a while. A lot of people get thrown into scenarios sure. where all of a sudden they're like, they need to get a house quick. They need to fix everything really, really fast. And it's like anything else, like doctors, like dentists, like IRS, you got to keep like it's not a fun thing to do. No one likes to do this stuff. Nobody. But you got to get a handle of this stuff because life does happen. Mm-hmm. Sometimes life pops in and all of a sudden you're like, I thought I'd be a bachelor for my, the rest of my life. But now I'm getting married or I got a kid on the way or mom needs to move in with me. Oh, I need more space. Rents are getting too high. So I'd, I would advise people like to kind of talk to someone who could help them. Sure. Help them a little, advise them on like what their steps should be to get a, to get in a position where if they, if they want to buy, if they can buy, um, you know, they're, they're able to do it. Right. Here's where I saw it be very interesting during the whole time. You know, this can be like, you know, the gold rush during the 2.75 age, you know what I mean? Like a lot of people were like, I want to take advantage yep. of the 2.75, but so many people were credit challenged. Yep. Employment was a big thing. And a lot of people couldn't maximize this. And it's like, well, at the end of the day, you know, maybe you wouldn't have got the 2.75, but even in r- relative to like what it is now, you probably would have got a better rate than oh, that yeah, on totally. right now. So it's like, don't let that kind of stuff scare you, right? Figure out your position, figure out where you kind of lay as far as the whole thing goes. That doesn't mean like, oh, I got to buy, I got to buy, I got to buy, but at least figure out where you stand, you know, that way, because when life does happen, you're at least in that stage of the game where you're ready to pounce if you can't, if you, if you have to, Mm -hmm. and you're not doing it last minute. And all of a sudden, like in this market, let's say you jump in the market now, right? With like a 540 or 560 credit score, all of a sudden your payment is like, woo, and you can't even qualify for the house you wanted. I mean, that's not a good position to be in. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, totally. 
Well, you know, you, you bring up, a, like you mentioned, the doctors, IRS, all that stuff. And obviously talking to a mortgage person about your credit is not that exciting. But I will point out that just like your doctor, your mortgage pro that you talk to, they've seen a million people naked. It's not anything exciting. Like there's nothing to be, you know, embarrassed about. I'm talking about your credit. So, you know. When, when uh, you know, you are having your finances reviewed by somebody like that, they look at that stuff all day. I mean, I've seen a million credit reports, and I could care less if you've got an 800 or a 500 or whatever. And at the end of the day, my goal, which I would assume is going to be the goal of any, you know, mortgage pro that you're talking to, I want to help you get a mortgage. That's what I do after all. So I'm not going to make fun of you or make you feel bad if, if you don't qualify today or whatever the case is. But... Figuring out a plan today, it's it would almost be like to use your doctor analogy. It's like wondering like if you have a disease or cancer or whatever. But instead of like going to the doctors and like having tests done and figuring out what the problem is, you just hide and you know wait for you know to become a bigger problem until one day you wake up and like your stomach hurts so bad that you finally go to the ER, or, you know, or or you have a kid and now like you don't have space and you have to buy a house and. Yep. Now I got to, I, now I got to address it or whatever the case is. So I would recommend to anybody that's, that's, you know, considering buying a house, um, that, you know, whether you think you've got stellar credit or, you know, you got challenge credit, look into it ahead of time. It only costs 64 bucks to get a soft credit re report done on you by a mortgage professional that gives you all three of your credit scores, all of your trade line history, all the information basically to know where you stand. And they can even use that report to like run those automated approvals with Fannie and Freddie and all that to see if, you know, exactly what you get approved for. Um, but until you reach out to somebody, you're just kind of guessing and everything. And when you, um, you know, when you guess, you're going to be wrong a lot of times. So I, I would just encourage anybody, don't be scared. It's not that big of a deal. Everybody's, you know, had problems, you know, in their past. And so, uh, you know, please reach out. Okay, one last question before, and this is a good question. Um, I've been waiting for the end of the video to ask this question. And before we go, um, what is the difference and what constitutes a hard pull and a soft pull on your credit? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question. Um, so a hard pull and a soft pull. A hard pull is going to show up on your credit report as an inquiry into your credit, meaning that you applied to get credit. And the whole purpose of a credit report and the scoring model of the credit report is to determine your credit worthiness. So let's say that you're a lender and you're determining somebody's credit worthiness and you pull their credit and you see that they've recently applied for 40 other loans. Well, that could raise a question of your credit worthiness. And, and a lot of times too, you apply for a loan and you get approved for that loan, it doesn't show up on your credit for a month or two or sometimes three months or whatever. So another reason why a hard credit pull can hurt your credit score is that they're they're assuming that you're taking on new debt basically and they've got to build that into the equation of, you know, how are you a good credit risk or a bad credit risk? A soft credit pull it's not an inquiry onto your, you're not actually applying for any, any loans. Um, although with the mortgage technology that we have, we can pretty much like get it all figured out without the hard pull at this point for most loans. Um, uh, but another thing, and this is a big deal too, as a consumer, especially on the mortgage side, it's not as bad with like cars and stuff like that. But if you have your credit pulled, like if, if I were to pull your credit right now, Mark, I bet you whatever you want to lose that tomorrow you'll get at least a hundred phone calls, a hundred text messages, a hundred of those fake voicemail drops, and that'll continue on for a good week or two. What are all those calls coming from? There's all these companies that exist like Rocket Mortgage and other call centers. That's their business model is they buy that info from the credit bureaus. Mm -hmm. That's how credit bureaus make a lot of money. Um, but they basically buy the knowledge that you just applied for a mortgage. And so they call you to basically see if they can do the mortgage for you. So the, the, you know, the hard pull, soft pull, the big deal between it, in my opinion, is obviously it hurts your score to have the hard pull. At a certain point, though, you do have to have the hard pull to get the loan done, but not to get pre-approved. But 
the other benefit of of skipping the hard pull, ditching all the annoying phone calls and all that stuff, especially if you're somebody that works from your cell phone for a living and not like from an office phone or something like that, dude, it is so annoying that your phone literally lighting up like a Christmas tree all day long. Call centers just blowing you up. Okay. Well, I think that kind of covered a lot of the yeah. good stuff and I don't want those calls. So I, you know, I'll follow your lead on that. Um, guys, if you're kind of freaked out, if credit is something that's kind of, you feel credit challenged, it's stopping you from jumping into the housing market. Maybe the timing is right in your life. Um, I would say reach out to us. There's a zoom link down below. We can talk to you a little bit about your situation, your credit, um, and put you on a path to maybe purchasing a home. If the time is right in your life. Again, guys, if you enjoy this video, like, Comment all the questions that you want to ask regarding this video too. Just post them below and we'll get to them. Um, we love to answer the questions uh, on the show. And we will see you guys next Monday to help you guys along your home buying journey. See ya.